Hi, good day. My name is Enrique Alvarez, and I'm here again for another very exciting episode of Logistics with Purpose. Hey, Maureen, how are you doing? Twice good, the same you, week. Enrique? I'm so yeah, happy that you're my co-host again. I know. I feel honored. I had to. Uh, I get to be uh, sharing this opportunity with you two days in a row. I know. I'm the one that's really happy to do it. And uh, of course, we have a very interesting guest, an organization that has been doing amazing for the last couple of years. And they have actually launched a couple of new um, tasks and uh, task force or or organizations even that we'll find out a little bit more um, with us today. And I guess without further ado, Dan Marsh, Chief Executive Officer at the WCA World. Hey, Dan, how are you doing? Hey, Enrique, I'm great. So it's good to see you again a couple of days after seeing you in the Netherlands. I know I, I had the pleasure of uh, having lunch with Dan this week, which is very rare, given that we're never in the same continent and he travels all around the world. So, yeah, thanks for thanks for giving me some time to do that, too. And isn't it great to be traveling again? I know it was fun to kind of see each other face to face, wasn't it? Yeah, it was brilliant. And the, the, the small conference we just had. Uh, to see all those smiling faces and people really overjoyed to be back in the same room and not doing what we're doing right now, but talking on Zoom, but actually actually sharing uh, stories and drinks together and, and reconnecting. It was, uh, it, it filled my heart after two years of, of, uh, of pain of not being able to see these people. So it was, it was a great week. Absolutely, especially you, right? As a leader of an organization that relies on networking and seeing each other face to face, it must have felt like, hey, reconnecting with old friends and exactly, it, it, you just slipped straight back into it. It's like it, you know, it, it's like it never happened, and and the people are still great, and they're so happy to, you know, be able to finally reconnect with each other from countries that that they hadn't seen each other for three years or so. It's. Uh, I'm glad it's back and let's hope it stays that way. Well, Dan, you're in the UK, right? I'm in the UK right now, yeah. Yeah, because you guys had some pretty strict lockdowns for a while as well, I think a, a bit more than we experienced in the US. So I'm sure uh, the yeah. feeling of freedom feels a little bit better for you because it was it, pretty it, strict. It is. We, we had it strict for certainly that first year and into the, oh. uh, the, the winter and spring of the second year was... Uh, it was tough. It came and went. You think you're coming out of it and then a new wave would hit and we'd all be locked down again. Yeah. But I, I, I think my wife and children are more glad that I'm traveling again than anyone because they've seen more than enough of me for two years. <laughs> That's funny. But yeah, so uh, the next one is a, is a conference in Dublin we have in, in June. Uh, that'll be bigger. That'll be 700 plus people and That'll be noisy and, and raucous, but a lot of business and a lot of new partnerships formed. So I can't wait for that. What's the topic for that one? Uh, it's just a regional conference. Okay. So um, we decided normally each year we do a very large conference with, with up to 3,000 freight forwarders attending of our members. Uh, it hasn't been possible in COVID. So we thought okay. this year, instead of doing uh, one, very large one, which is which has been problematic to organise, as you can imagine. We normally yeah. hold it in Asia. Asia's parts of Asia are still in lockdown. Right. We're holding a series of a little bit smaller, but still pretty large regional conferences. So it's it's no theme. It's just anyone from anywhere in the world that can make it to Europe can come along and reconnect with all their current partners and hopefully find some new business. Well, I'm, I'm going to check my calendar for that one in Dublin, right, Enrique? <laughs> That sounds like a fun one. Uh, but so before before we jump too ahead of ourselves, yeah. right? Because yes. uh, we'll talk a little more about the WCA and your professional career in a second. But going back to your childhood, if you could tell us a little more about who Dan Marsh is. Who, who, who are you, Dan? Well, <laughs> that's a very interesting question. You probably get a lot of it's a loaded questions question. But I, I was born in, um, in a historic city in the, in the west of England called Bristol. It's an old port city in the uh, early 1970s and uh, I grew up, spent my first 18 years there with uh, my three siblings and, and my parents um, and it was a lot of fun. We, it was tough times in the early 80s in the UK. It was, it was economically struggling a bit. Um, we didn't have tons of material possessions or goods but I had a great um, environment to live in, great friends, 
supportive family and and I had a a lot of fun I probably should have worked a bit harder but I had a lot of fun and and a pretty happy childhood so that was my uh my start in life um and then I moved off to university in London. Well, hold on, before before you rush, we're yeah. not gonna let you go that easily when it comes to your childhood days. But um, yeah. so favorite sport? Well, uh, traditionally the West Country where I grew up, rugby was was the big sport. Um, certainly in schools. Uh, so the winter sport was rugby. The summer sport was cricket. Two sports that I know in the US doesn't have a lot of. Uh, <laughs> Uh, penetration into the into the into, into the social fabric but also soccer or football as we call it um was also big as the rest of the world calls it <laughs> right. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's only either calls it soccer but uh yeah uh i played any sport i could i loved it i and i was cycling all the time played tennis swam for the county uh did a bit of running for the county i think i was hyperactive but i was always uh always act the house doing something or other, whether it was uh, cycling around town, doing stuff with my friends or doing organized sport. That's what, uh, what I really enjoyed. But rugby is a great game. Uh, it's a bit like, I guess, the closest thing you have is, is NFL, American football. Uh, it's a little different, but it's, um, it teaches you a lot of values that other sports don't. There's a real code of, of behavior and ethics in rugby that I think stands you in good stead. And I it's still- It's a physical still, sport, isn't it? It's physical, it's very physical, yeah. but but the crazy thing is that you uh, you bash the living daylights out of your opposition for, for an hour and a half on the, uh, on the rugby pitch. But the minute that final whistle's gone, it's gone and you, you, you all, have a drink together, share together, have a meal together. You put on your club tie and have dinner together afterwards and reminisce and say, hey, yeah, you got me when you stamped on my head or <laughs> kicked me in the face. Yeah, that was a good one. And, and all the, you know, all the aggression's gone on the pitch and it's all about the social afterwards. So it's a good balance. A little bit dangerous, but a good balance. <laughs> Any story, Dan, kind of from your early days that kind of shaped who, who you are and slowly starting to give us some hints into what you chose, the professional path that, that you um, chose? Well, maybe if we go back to the rugby, I, I was, as I said, I went to school. I went to a state school, not a fee paying school. We didn't have the money to go for me to go to one of the top schools or my, or my siblings. So uh, rugby at school, we played a lot of um uh, expensive fee schools uh, who were very good, had the top coaches, top equipment, top training, even us, uh, you know, um, had scholarships for the better rugby players. Whilst we were a, a state school where our, our sports teacher was on strike most of the, the, the year we, I was playing <laughs> in the top level. And what, what it taught me, um, we decided to come together as a team even though we had no organized training and we decided at the beginning of the year, we were going to try and beat some of these better schools that we hadn't beaten for two decades. So we, we sort of trained together and then it came to the match day where we played the, one of the top two schools, which was um, in a beautiful surroundings, very opulent uh, and us bedraggled people with wrong colored socks on turned up and they were laughing at us, but we knew we were pretty good by then. And, we were determined and we knew we we tried hard we trained hard we didn't have the facilities but we went into the game and and it always sticks in my mind because we we won that game narrowly but it was a shock on the faces of this very uh privileged school and and the pupils within the school that they'd been beaten by the uh the oaks from down the road nice. and, the uh, underdogs yeah and, win again and, and that, and that and that's what taught me. I mean, I've always loved to, to fight for the underdog. And I think it's much more satisfying to uh, be an underdog and, and, and achieve than to, to have that um, privilege at the beginning and, and maintain it. It's, uh, and it's the two things that taught me it was teamwork because we didn't have better play. We weren't better players. We just were a better team and we just wanted it more. And those two things, I think, if you want something, 
and you apply yourself, but also you bring a team with you, you're going you're gonna to succeed more than you're going to fail for sure. So I guess that's one of the lessons I took. Um, the other thing was, uh, I didn't tell you, but um, my, my father was an aviation nut and he trawled me around air shows and airfields every weekend from when I could barely walk for, for years and years and years. And I got a real aviation bug. So uh, I, uh, I decided to, that the, my career path was to, would be to join the Air Force. I wanted to be a fighter pilot. But um, for various reasons, that didn't work out. Um, what, was your dad a, a pilot or did he no, he, he just, pilot he just, any planes or he just loved planes? But When he was younger, he was, he was actually um, born, you know, just before the Battle of Britain in 1940 when the Germans were, were bombing Bristol because Bristol had a big a aircraft manufacturing airfield. And uh, his, uh, my grandmother put him under the table when the bombs were falling or down in the oh. homemade air raid shelter. But soon after that, you know, in the post-war era where aviation was expanding, the first jet aircraft, a lot of the development in the UK was done uh, up the road at the airfield near Bristol. And my dad used to cycle up there and see these wacky planes and prototypes nice. flying, and he just got a bug for it. And then eventually he saved up enough to get his private pilot's license. So then he flew a little Cessna for all his life. He's 83 and he's giving up his license this, this year, but he's flown every year since before i was born till till this year he's wow. his little cessna around and did I you guys fly with you or your siblings had to fly with him at all when you were younger yeah yeah uh -huh. i mean well i thought that was normal on a saturday you get <laughs> That's up, awesome. you, you get in a little plane and i'll tell you one, one little trick he used to do with me so when when you are flying a cessna you know that's left right uh, up and down but on the ground you'll you'll you steer with the rudder pedals with your feet so when you're going around corners on the ground, when I was five, my dad used to sit me on his on his lap on the controls and say, all right, you can steer it back to the hangar. And I always thought I was doing it with this, but really he was doing it with, with his feet. So for, uh, so for five years, I was like, did I steer that well, dad? He go, yeah, that was brilliant. You did it perfect. Like, yeah, I'm really good at this. Not really right, it's that. awesome. No, actually, I wasn't doing anything at all. <laughs> that is a great story yeah. yeah did you ever learn to fly as well dan yeah so that that sort of comes on to later stage. i really wanted to be a fighter pilot and i went to uni but at the same time i applied to the air force and they said right we'll put you on a scholarship we'll teach you to fly small planes as uh, initial training whilst you're uh, before actually i went to uni in that summer before so i flew solo in a light plane before i got my driving license oh, so, wow yeah <laughs> i flew flew solo in a little plane at 17 and i hadn't even i couldn't even drive a car so that was quite strange oh. that first time you got up on your own at 17 is quite strange as well mm. but then i went away to uni did my course for three years and when i came out uh there were big defense cuts in the uk and they said hey we're not we're not taking on any pilots for three or four years so that was a tough time for me uh because i had what I thought right. I wanted to do set in my mind. And I think that teaches you, you know, looking back at when I was that age, if I could go back, I would say, don't waste that next year being, you know, upset and angry, but actually realize that, okay, a door shut, but, but another one will open if you go and look at, look for it and you go and kick it down. So I, I probably did waste, uh, a year of my life not knowing what I was doing and feeling a bit sorry for myself at 21 but then uh, I thought I'd better do something about it and, and moved on and became a, a military journalist next best thing so I did all the flying and fast jets but just as a journalist not as a not as a pilot so I traveled around the world with air forces for about uh, how long uh, 15 years 12 12 years um, wow Going on exercise. So you, you had the travel bug early on as well, right? I yeah, mean, yeah. That's not only flying, but bug. going and visiting new places, it sounds like. Yeah. So, so with the Air Force, we went on exercise to Canada and the US. I also flew with the US Navy. I flew with the Czech Air Force. I flew wow. with the Singapore Air Force. I flew with 
what Aladdin. do you have to do when you're on those planes? You're taking notes and interviewing. What's, yeah, we're, what's we're the role? interviewing. I mean, sometimes if you're on exercise, you're you're doing it for, for military publications who who you obviously can't reveal too many secrets. But you're talking about right. the aircraft, the tactics, the pilots. You know, um, but flying in a fast jet is not easy. You get out exhausted. You, you, you know, you're pulling a lot of g-force. And it's very easy to pass out. You quite often get that black shroud come around your vision till it goes to a spot, and then the G force comes oh. comes off and it disappears. But just right when that, you get off the plane, you feel that way, or while you're flying? No, whilst you're flying, because yeah. you know you, you're doing these big high G. So if you're a, a I don't know, a 150 pound guy, if you pull you know, 5G, you, you, you weigh six, 700 pounds yeah. and your head weighs yeah. six times what it normally does and so do your arms. So it's it's very physical, actually. Although you're sitting, not moving, flying a fast jet, I can tell you, it's really physical. you got to be fit. I couldn't do it now. Did, did one of those pilots ever let you fly a little bit? I mean, wouldn't yeah, you, yeah. couldn't you convince them to do that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, when it's safe, you can, uh, you know. Okay, let, uh, me, <laughs> let me take over. I thought, <laughs> I've done. I've dropped dummy bombs on a Welsh bridge. That's I've, awesome. uh, I've launched dummy torpedoes from a plane called a Nimrod in in the Arctic Ocean against a, a pretend Russian submarine. All sorts of stuff. That Soviet sounds super submarine, cool. I should say from those days, not Russian. But yeah, it was fun. Um, and, uh, then the red tape got too much after the you know um, first Gulf War and, and so on. It came a lot harder to get access to the people and the aircraft. It became a lot more restrictive and the fun sort of drifted out of it. And I thought it's time for a career change. So I went into logistics. <laughs> oh, so yes, uh, explain us that huge job. <laughs> pivot though, how did you do that? Yeah. Well, it actually came about because uh, I I decided I was looking for a new new career, but I was, I was an editor and a journalist, so I thought I'd stay in that. And I was talking to someone. They said, "Hey, there's a there's a job come up at, at one of the at the time one of the leading logistics publications in Europe that was called Air Cargo News." And I thought, "My word, that sounds boring." <laughs> <laughs> well, every <laughs> job is going to sound boring after. Yeah, uh, you're flying in a. Dummy, yeah, yeah right. dropping dummy bombs on targets yeah. and yeah. But, but then I, I went for the interview and I thought, well, actually, there's a bit more to this. And I thought it's not just talking about people packing boxes. It's actually a whole world of supply chain and all, stuff that people don't really realize is going on. And they don't realize how everything moves around the world and, and the people involved. And by then I was, I was really getting more um, interested in the, in the stories of how things worked and, and the people behind them rather than than just reporting on how fast an aeroplane can fly. So it, I joined and I had a great five, six years there. I, uh, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot about the business and I sort of caught the bug that logistics is not a glamorous business, but the people within it are not only inventive and clever, but they are also great people and very sociable and happy to to give their knowledge to other people and happy to pass that on. You don't get that in every industry, but in our industry, I've really found a real openness and, and eagerness to not only learn from other people, but to give, give you know, your knowledge and information to other people. So I sort of fell in love with it. And, uh, and from that point, where we were also doing some events, I first met the founder of WCA, David Yoakum, and uh, we, we, we held a joint event in Bangkok. And well, Dan, before, before you go any further, what, what is yeah. the WCA? For everyone that's listening to us right now, yeah. and some of them may, some of them might not know what the WCA is and, and sure. what is it about. You could tell us a quick kind of uh, explanation. I'll give, I'll give you a quick synopsis. Uh, so back in the, in the 90s, you know, uh, logistics is expanding. Um, there's, there's logistics companies around the world, but... The, the real explosion from China and Asia and goods traveling around the world, it became more and more difficult for independent freight forwarding companies, logistics companies, to find the partners 
they need to, to, to complete the shipments easily and securely and you know they can trust these people. So um, say you're a forwarder in the US, you, you start off as a customs broker, and you go, I, I want to get a bit more into the freight forwarding and transportation side. Uh, I've got some customers, but how do I find a how do I find a partner in Germany, in Nigeria, in South Africa, in Taiwan, in, in Hong Kong? I don't know them. Do I get out a book and just take potluck? And there, there was no Google back then, right? You couldn't Google There was no that. internet. There was no, uh, you know, you just had to try and find a directory somewhere and, and take potluck and phone up and hope they, they were good companies and, and were going to do the profit share with you fairly. Wow. So um, at that time, uh, our founder... Uh, and still chairman, Dave Yoakum. Um, his brother was a, a customs broker and he learned a little bit about the business and decided that what they really needed as, a, as an industry or as SME companies, logistics companies in the industry was a, was a network that could not only bring in the good companies and audit them to check they were financially secure and, and could do the things they claimed, but also um, connect people or provide that that network that allowed you, instead of spending days searching for a partner and, and then having to credit check them or audit them, you could just join the network and know you were secure in working in that network and build your business within the network. And I must say it took David uh, a huge amount of effort and time and risk and his own, you know, uh, passion because he was a, a one or, or maybe a two person uh, band at the beginning. Tra he was traveling 300 days a year to every country to try and find members to, to attract them to the network. And those first few years were tough. Um, but he did it and I brought on more people and, and WCA now is the largest logistics network in the world. We have members in now 181 countries wow um we have over 10,500 member offices something a little over seven and a half thousand companies um each one is audited each one can work with another member with full financial security and and save save themselves a lot of time money and effort and and locate really good partners to build their business it's like the good parts of a multinational without the bad right. parts. <laughs> you, you've got the global reach. You've got the uh, ability to, to find a, an agent or a solution anywhere, whether it's pharma, dangerous goods, uh, project cargo, whatever it is, um, you can find someone in the network who can handle your goods, but you don't have the issue, but you still have that personal touch right. that the smaller companies have with their customers, that personal service that only small and regional forwarders can provide just because of their size i'm not going to make this by any means a, a a large multinational bashing because they certainly have their place and they do you know the, the, some work that, that a smaller forwarder couldn't do but in terms of providing service a personal service but with a global reach that was what wca was really intended to solve and I think we're a, we've gone a long way to to help a lot of members achieve that. No, absolutely. Um, did you do you think that? Uh, and I I wanted to ask you that the other day. Uh, but um, do you think there was like a key moment or like a key strategy where at some point David and his team back then reached that tipping point and because yes. just went from literally from zero, right? I mean, it li he literally. Yes had the first member the second member and all of a sudden there's 10,000 in 180 yeah. countries plus and you guys continue to grow what what was that what do you think that that changed there, there were two things that really helped one was so so david started in 1998 um china what the first thing is china was just opening up uh really really started growing at an incredible rate and exporting exports were multiplying each year by by ludicrous amounts and everyone wanted a piece of the market and but didn't know how to connect with china so david spent a huge amount of time in china getting to know not only the the, the, the freight forwarding association which is government owned cifa who who were a big help but also anyone he could find in, in logistics in china he would go back and back and back until he had 
the, the 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 reputation there that would allow him to talk to to people at a level that to get things done. And China is now still massively important for us. It's still massively important for everyone. But that provided a big catalyst for us. We we had a sort of ability to open up China that most other people didn't at that time. The other the other very important thing that we did at that time was introduce the financial protection that no one else wow. offered at that time. That is really a big glue. So before we could find you a member, but if you're on a profit share, you were you still, still need never, to trust. Right. You were still yeah. never guaranteed to get your money because they could go bankrupt. They could decide that you'd done something wrong. There was a dispute over the shipment. With WCA, we said, right, okay, we are confident in our members. So what we're going to say is, if your partner doesn't pay you, we will pay you. So if if wow. your partner uh, defaults on a payment, you don't have to worry. You just make a claim after 90 days and we will pay what you were owed. And that has been probably at that time the key uh, benefit that was introduced and is still very important today that allows members to work with complete peace of mind with another member. Uh, their accounting teams obviously love it because right. they don't have to credit check every company they work with because they, they know that if they don't get paid, will pay and uh yeah that was that was unique in the industry at the time no one else was offering that and that brought in a lot of members through referrals because if you're working with someone who's a non-member you want to be protected so you'll say hey you should join this group um or sometimes even i'm not going to carry on working with you unless you join this group so it it was almost through referral a member recommendations to the partners they already worked with that that helps us grow at a really healthy rate from all through the uh through the, the period from 2002 three onwards so yeah that makes sense so dan something real quick that i think it's worth noting is that you talked about how the company really started you know in the late 90s and for most of us we forget what it was like before Google and the internet and yeah. your very savvy website where you log in and yeah. you look at the country you're looking for and the agents there and then what do they what do they do and it's already a yeah. vetted system. Do you have any perspective on how the the first kind of iteration of the WCA network spread its wings? Was it was it a catalog that people subscribed to or how did you get the, your name out there because you did all yeah, this it, work and but how did how did you actually connect people it, it was it was really a case of number one um fairly rapidly establishing uh offices in various regions so we we set up in china very early with our own office we set up in in asia in bangkok we set up in europe in amsterdam very early and in the US and also at that time in Argentina in, in Southern America. So having that local um, presence uh, was important because we could go and physically see the members and if they needed anything or needed recommenders or connections. Um, actually in the late nineties, that's just when the internet was getting going. So it was dial up, it was slow. If mm -hmm. you remember dial up, yeah, <laughs> you know, you you take uh, ten yeah, minutes to get online, and, but it worked. Mm -hmm. and, and very soon we did have uh, a usable directory and database uh, on on online. Yes, it was much slower than it was today, but people could still use that. Along with using our staff, they would phone up and still do every day at all our offices and say, "Hey Dan, hey Owen, hey hey Monica." I'm looking for an agent who's got cold storage who can do this or that, or I'm looking for an agent who can handle this type of commodity or who's the best agent you have in this city. And our, our staff are still either by email or phone every day, uh, linking people together. Yeah. Of course, people find their own partners, especially at the meetings. And, and the meetings are really important because you cannot, 
really do long-term business with someone unless you sat down face to face with them i truly believe that still it's really important to get to know the person and trust them and then you're ready to develop business together and those long-term partnerships instead of having to travel to 40 countries to see all your partners you can go to one meeting at wca you can meet them all in a week you save tens of thousands on travel and weeks of travel time to be able to meet all your partners in one place at one time plus the opportunity to develop new business with new people so those those conferences have always been vital in in connecting people together you think you're going to work with a company but you get meet them and see what they've got and other people have got and when you see it in the flesh maybe you think i've just got a better chemistry with this company i'm going to go with them yeah um and that's the way it works uh the conferences were really important they were extremely well intended pretty much every member would attend once or twice a year to to meet met their partners and, and, and create new partnerships face to face but yeah so it, it's a mixture of phone email referrals from us uh the conferences and obviously now we've got a much more sophisticated uh website and database where people can find people but they still come to us to say is this company any good we find them on the we know they're a member we find them on the directory we know they're a member but can you tell us a bit more about them it's um yeah and i think i agree with you it's always going to be about the relationship right it's really about uh people connecting with people and technology helps and supports that but at the end of the day nothing beats the fact that you can talk to someone face to face and and get a feel of what their company is because usually individuals reflect a little bit of the values behind their organizations um and in the same sense uh the wca and changing gears a little bit uh dan although marina i I think you had one question on this topic before we switch quickly well, I, ha- I had a question. It wasn't something we had talked about beforehand, but I was thinking about, you know, we're building upon, Enrique and I have talked about this the past couple interviews we've been on, and I've, it's a recurring theme, I think, in the supply chain logistics industry right now is that nobody really understood what we did or yeah. what until COVID, until now, right. when it's like, where's my stuff, right? So yeah. all these conversations, Enrique and I talked about this yesterday, like, before COVID, we'd talk about what we would do, and people just kind of give you that blank stare, and yeah. then change the subject. Now, you you can tie in supply chain, operations, logistics into most conversations because it's so relevant to all these other industries that nobody ever thought about. So, we talked about that a little bit, but then also we're talking about face to face relationships, meeting people. And then what happens, COVID happened, we're all kind of on lockdown, but what happened to our industry, that did not really slow down, that was busier. Um, And so any sort of insight or takeaways you had from that experience with the WCA, you know, two years of lockdowns that were kind of occurring in different areas of the world at, at different times, but you know, a necessity for increased volume. There's all these things yeah. changing. Um, yeah. We're kind of coming out of that now, but we'd love to hear any of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I you know, when, when COVID struck, I, I don't think any of us knew quite what was going to happen. There was a lot of nervousness about it. I think we all thought um, it was going to be two weeks, of oh, two-week lockdown. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and then it went on and the people like, oh dear, are we going to have to change our model? Are we going to have to make people redundant um are we going to survive are we going to prosper and what became apparent is that to a couple of things first of all our members are so because of their size are so much more flexible and these ease can easily adapt to situations so immediately there was a lot of chatter um i'll give a couple of examples we set up a charter forum immediately for our members who you remember the demand for ppe at that time was huge. No one could get any PPE. Every country wanted it. Every country was, and, and all the passenger airlines stopped flying. So there was no lift. So the demand for freighters was was crazy to fly mm-hmm. this stuff around. So we managed to set up a, a, a charter, um, a sort of charter group, a forum um, that allowed airlines who had aircraft, freight forwarders, logistics providers, anyone involved to coordinate on a single platform for PPE shipments. 
So that that's an, another immediate thing of how technology can help. You can sort of get everyone who's got a sudden need on a platform, give them the basics and say, look, here's, if you've got a request, put it here. If you've got a capacity, put it here. If you've got uh, the materials, put it here. And we'll link you all together. And that worked really well. Then we set up a number of uh, social media pages for people to post information about what was going on in various countries, um, the restrictions at the borders and so on and so forth. So that became a, a tool for members to see, OK, uh, what's the situation in Germany right now? Is it restricted? Is there capacity? Are there, are there, are there any trucks? Are the ports open? Um, uh, and that was useful as well. So I think I think being a small, you know, on the smaller side of company, you can adjust quickly. I think our members did adjust quickly. We adjusted quickly from our meetings. We created our own virtual conference platform. We held the last two years a whole series of virtual conferences, online meetings, which was almost unanimously people said, OK, it's not quite the same as face to face. And we still want that face-to-face -face contact, but it, with that, but as we couldn't, this was darn near the, the next best thing. And we, we still managed to connect with our partners and, and generate some business and, and, you know, and do the stuff we were doing before just in a virtual world. And, I, and, and it just shows that technology is going to just play an absolutely vital role in, in logistics going forwards. I truly believe that any logistics company that, isn't prioritizing technology and how they're going to operate in the digital world in the next 10, 20 years is probably going to be left behind. I don't think there's a place for relying on making $100 on the freight charges on a container anymore. I think, I think you have to have great service, great customer service, and part of that has got to be your, your digital evolution of your company into providing the best service you can. Absolutely. That's something something we have to work on yeah. as well. Equally hard, if not more hard, to provide those tools for the members and also tools for us to communicate with the members. Because I, I don't think I don't think kids these days are, uh, will we do, they will be doing business the same way as we've done it. It'll it's not going to change overnight, um, and I don't think everything will be virtual. I think there'll still be a place for meeting in person and face to face meetings and and doing business in the traditional way. But those digital tools are, will be the enabler to make your company either a success or a failure. Absolutely. Um, yeah, definitely. And I know that the WCA has been investing in technology uh, for quite some yeah. time now, and they'll continue. There's plans to actually continue doing so. So, yeah. Dan, the, if you could tell us a little bit more, and just, again, uh, you are part of this episode because of uh, logistics with purpose and the amazing job that WCA is doing in Ukraine. And I believe that you launched uh, a fund as well, and you are doing tons of other things, not only on the technology side of things, but the financial side of things. And yeah. of course, helping and changing the world uh, with a very, uh, I would say, purpose-driven organization that you're currently leading. Um, could you tell us a little more uh, about all the different projects that you have going on right now, all the different services, and then a little bit get into a little more detail on the on the Ukraine situation, how you faced it, and and what your organization and the WCA members are trying to do, and what the response has been because it's uh, it's inspiring, sure. really. Yeah, sure. Um, first of all, I'll, ju I'll just run over some of the other bits and pieces we've developed over the years because it's 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 been you know really good for our members to be able to take advantage of these things that we can offer as a group uh for instance our partner pay uh, there's more and more pay solutions online digital pay solutions hitting the market every day but uh, many people don't realize that we had a digital online payment system between members established 11 years ago and the difference with ours is we don't do it as a commercial venture so Members can pay each other completely free of charge with no wire fees and no foreign currency markup when you're paying from one currency to another. So I don't know. There's been members who said that it saved them 30, 40,000 in banking fees a year, some of our bigger members using partner pay rather than straight wire transfers through the bank. So 
that's one thing that we've been able to connect the members to is, is instant payments through our technology uh, and completely free. So that's that's a member, huge member benefit. Um, some of the other things we've done is, is we found that a lot of members didn't understand or had poor quality uh, insurance. I know insurance is a boring subject, but there's uh, there's two types of insurance that we, we do. One is the happy one, is cargo insurance, which you can offer to your customers and you can charge an admin fee or, or whatever to, for that service and you can make some money on the insurance. So we offer an online cargo insurance program where any member can take whatever commodity that their shipper is shipping and say to their customer, hey, I can insure that for you. Let me let me try through uh, through the platform, get an instant quote. And then, and then, you know, put on their fee and, and, and charge it back to the customer. The customer's happy because their cargo is protected and the Ford is happy because um, they're making a, a little bit more money by adding an extra level of service to their customer. So that's, that's been really successful. And the other, quickly, the other type of insurance is the not so happy insurance is the liability insurance. There's something that a lot of forwarders neglect is to make sure they're protecting their business against, you know, we all make mistakes. We all have errors and omissions, you know, errors and omissions insurance, um, liability insurance is really important, especially, you know, when things go wrong on a, on a shipment, yet your customers hold, holding you liable for that. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people don't really, they think they have it, but they don't really look at their policy to see what it actually covers. Um, so, we, we've got a, a, a product called Forward and Protect and we mark our members that do have either ours or another good liability insurance from another third party to show other members that these these companies are are protected legally against against legal action for any any mistakes they may have made or or any even unjust actions people bring against them. So this is rather easily to do as well, right? I think if someone's listening to us out there, if you're a, a logistics company or work for a logistics company, and uh, yeah. if you have your, everyone probably has already a liability insurance, but it's easy to just send, they, they can send you their information. You can compare their insurance to yours. It's very uh, straightforward, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, you can, you know, on either type of insurance, you can sign up to the cargo uh, insurance scheme and, and there's no obligation to use it right. but anytime you want to insure a product you can just do it straight through the platform and on the liability side um, just drop a note to, to our, our, our in-house company which is World Insurance Service um, and they'll be happy happy to give you a quote on 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 any on your liability insurance um, and we'll add uh we'll add all those links for people that are listening to yeah. us and uh, they're probably just taking notes so don't worry about it uh enjoy the conversation yeah. we'll add all those notes to the um uh, to the in interview after after the show when we post it great and, and i interrupted you so you were saying the not so happy insurance that's where yeah that's so that, where that's the liability that's where <laughs> and, you're protecting yourself so you know is, we all need it you don't make right. any money on it, but it protects your business. Right. And if you don't have it, your business could disappear one day through through no real fault of your own. So all I would say to everyone is make sure you, whoever it's with, make sure your liability insurance is, is of a decent standard. Um, then there's technology. I mean, we're, we're, we've been working hard on a number of products right from the beginning of, of providing an electronic airway bill platform to connecting members through various digital platforms. Um, we're working on a number of, with a number of partners on, on various new products. We're looking to launch this year uh, an emissions tool that will allow members to um, evaluate and upload and get certificated for all of their emissions. Uh, it's more and more important to customers these days. They're demanding to know or, or governments are demanding to know from them what their emissions are, so they need to know from their logistics provider. Um, an offsetting program as well that allow companies to offset, uh, or their customers to offset their emissions. That's one, one uh, tool we're working with. We're working on with a number of other partners on developing better ways to connect directly into shipping lines and airlines to, to not only for, for rate, uh, management but also for direct bookings i think 
the days of, of phoning up your local airline or shipping rep for a rate are pretty much coming to an end. Yeah. And uh, that's in five five years' time, you know, there's, that's all pretty much going to be done digitally. And, and you need to be able to quickly evaluate the best uh, solutions in terms of rates and, and routes, you know, from a computer screen rather than the old days of collecting all the faxes you had in every morning and working out, you know, who was who was charging what, but being able to utilise digital technology to do that for you so your staff can get on with, with less, mean, you know, menial tasks and get on with growing the business. Well, and tell us uh, about the foundation, which is something that... Uh, yeah, so David... has been incredible, right? Yeah, I mean... It's a slight coincidence. Uh, late last year, we started saying, right, we've done some ad hoc uh, charity work and and we did a number of shipments and work with members quite a lot um, when Beirut not only had a, a financial crisis, but then had that huge port explosion. Yeah. Um, and, and they're still suffering from that still now uh, and they're still needing help. But we, we did... Uh, with a number of members, some shipments of initially aid and then rebuilding materials and, a, and some financial support to our members. And we thought, you know, these these uh, natural disasters or human disasters or wars or famines or whatever they are, they're always going to, something's always going to be happening. And our members always like to help, but, you know, there's no focal point to allow people to work together to to provide solutions either at cost or even quite often free to to help members and and the communities they live in so we decided to establish the wca foundation it's a fully registered charitable organization in the u.s um and the primary goal was to to provide funding and also a focal point for our members to help with these these you know major or even sometimes less regional uh disasters or or natural events or or wars or civil unrest but people where where people are in difficulty maybe we can lend a hand so we were planning to launch that in our dubai conference um we did but also at that time uh the conflict in ukraine started um which was obviously a shock um, right. and that was a quick test for us because immediately um, we had a lot of, we could see what was happening, that there was a huge refugee exodus from Ukraine, that there was a lot of damage to civilian areas um, and also our, our members. We were worried about, we had 20 plus companies in Ukraine. We were worried about our members, they, trying to stay in touch with them, check that they were okay, uh, trying to get them evacuated if we could. Um, and try and support them. So uh, WCA put in some initial funding into the foundation. Um, I'm glad to say uh, quite a number of members have also contributed, um, and it doesn't have to be much. You know, $50, $100, it, when you've got 10,000 members, it soon adds up to a sizable amount. Part of the foundation's briefing from David was strictly all money uh, donated will go directly to the projects there's no admin fee there's no managers we're paying there's no staffing costs our staff will do this for free or we we'll, we'll employ people out of our own pocket so we want people to be reassured that a hundred dollars out of a hundred dollars they they put there is, is going to the cause not not to marketing or or, or, or wages or salaries yeah yeah so i, I suddenly became thrust uh uh or thrust myself uh, towards uh, well you clearly didn't have enough aid. things to do right <laughs> so uh, so i can see why <laughs> i thought i better just see what we can do uh with ukraine so i talked to a lot of members both in the bordering countries and in ukraine itself just to see what the situation was see what they needed see how goods could be uh transported to and from how hard it was to get stuff into ukraine and we started working it out. We started working with some other charities and and with some real great support from a number of members in 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 the UK, Poland, 
Romania and, and various other countries, including you guys in the US, um, we've managed to make an impact. I mean, I'm not I'm not going to claim we've 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 done some outstanding life changing work, but we've managed to, I think, make a difference in, in some areas by I think we've had, I don't know, 20, 30 shipments of aid yeah. directly into Ukraine now. We've had a few more to the refugee camps in the border. We've supplied um, materials and sleeping bags or the materials to make uh, blankets and sleeping bags to a uh, factory set up by uh, women and widows in Ukraine to, to make uh, these materials for the, for the camps. Um, we've bought heaters and water heaters and, and all this sort of stuff for, for inside Ukraine. Uh, and and some medical medical supplies as well so i think everyone's doing what they can but uh, i'm pleased to say that the members contributions are going to good use and and our members uh, are very grateful uh i think for for the support of their fellow members that that understand it's not about taking sides in the right. war it's about seeing a humanitarian crisis and helping the people that are in need and and our members have stepped up and hopefully we've been a good catalyst to help help them to help uh, the Ukrainian people at this time of need. But but as, as people have said, you know, this this won't be a short term thing. They're going to need support and help for years to come. However long this conflict lasts, uh, the rebuilding, the, 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 the suffering and, and the, the investment that's going to be needed to rebuild Ukraine is, is going to be, you know, probably a decade or more yeah. so it's easy to watch it on the news and then after six months it sort of disappears from the back of your mind but it, i think it's always important to remember that actually the hard work will start when the conflict ends probably uh, partly and there's also all sorts of other things going on all around the world that that we now also need to take a focus on and and not uh, it was never our intention for all the the charity work to be as a Ukraine support thing, there are plenty of other people in need and, and members who need support that uh, that we'll, we'll look at and invest in uh, as we get a chance in the next year, two years, three years. So it's exciting for me to do something like this. Uh, as I said, becoming a, a, a freight forward in terms of aid. I've never been a freight forward in my life. I had no idea what I was doing. I relied <laughs> on on you guys and, and our wonderful members to help me get uh get the shipments in and out and it's been a team effort and I'm I'm pretty proud of what we managed to accomplish so far and you guys you know uh, you guys are typical of our members who who have stepped up and 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 not looking at commercial gain but just looking at, at what's needed and and working really hard um to provide solutions and um it's amazing what you guys are doing and uh, I'm proud of our members like Vector who are, who are really involved and, and put the suffering of these people um, to the forefront of their mind and act upon it. So I great think, work. Uh, I think we're all following your lead. I think, uh, again, you're a very purpose, mindful, driven individual. And I think it reflects in the uh, organization, the WCA, David was is the same way. And I know that everyone wants to really make a positive impact in the world. And so I, you know, speaking for me, my company, uh, we're just proud to be part of such a dynamic, caring and uh, impactful group of people. So uh, congratulations to you and, and all the other members, because uh, it's been, it's been, uh, very inspiring, as I as I told you before before we started recording. Maureen, you you yeah. wanted to say something too? No, I mean I think both of you are in a position where your leadership ability and the direction of what you're doing with the organization has a trickle down effect, and you can see, Dan, you can see what we're doing at Vector. You know, there's trickle down effect from Enrique and what he's made a priority to do, and then therefore we are all excited to to be with there's no internal conflict with us about wanting to support anyone that that needs something more than we do right and so with you at the wca taking that leadership stance and like i said leading by example it lets the entire organization see where the priorities are 
and how to focus and move forward. And like you said, there's a collective effort of trying to help others. And that doesn't happen um, as easy if it's only a grassroots movement. I think when you have support at both ends, um, there's definitely so much more that you can accomplish. And I think also, uh, you know, I, I'm sure Enrique will agree, uh, you're only as strong as a platform you're built on and both in terms of the network and us as a company, my staff, um, I wouldn't have been able to do this stuff if I didn't have our, our, our management and our executive management behind us who are so capable of their jobs. I can literally take my hands off for three weeks or a month or whatever and concentrate on this and, and they don't, they don't need my help. They're, they're so capable. Um, of, uh, and and even with the Ukraine thing, it was it was great to be able to lean on our staff and say, "Hey, you know the members really really well in Germany. Can you can you recommend to me who could do this right. or that?" And I rely I rely on our staff for everything really. It's a it's a great it's yeah you you have a good team. Um, at times running out. Uh, two things, very very final yeah. things. Uh, the first one is. People that are listening to us, I'm sure they have enjoyed this conversation. Where can they learn more about the WCA? Where can they connect with you? Um, where can you? Yeah. Uh, where can they know a little bit more about the Ukraine and possibly even uh, donate if, if they want to and if they so uh, want to join this movement? Sure. So it, it, WCA is is a global network. We we accept not only any freight forwarder that's been established more than a couple of years, we'll, you're free to apply for membership. We do have criteria. I'm not going to go into them now, but that's a bit boring. But if it interests you, uh, please get in touch with us. Uh, all the contacts are on our website, www.wcaworld.com. You can find your regional representative and they'll happily talk to you all through the benefits of joining and so on. But also if you're uh, any other company that works with in logistics, we have a, a program called the Vendor Membership, where we have airlines, charter brokers, IT companies, um, all sorts of companies that that provide services to uh, the logistics chain. Um, please also get in contact because um, freight forwarders don't stand on their own. They need right. IT, they need airlines, they need shipping lines, they need trucking companies, they need all these various segments of the supply chain to work in harmony. And we like to bring in these vendors as well so we can work with them to provide uh, better services to our members. Absolutely. So yeah, you can go to our website, same with the foundation. Uh, you'll find, find details uh, of the foundation at WCA World. Um, and you can find out more and, and find out how we manage to support 10,000 uh, small and medium-sized freight forwarding companies. Um, we'll, put, uh, we'll put all the information as well so you guys just click, uh, click on the links um, Dan uh, very short call to action to our viewers anything yep. that you would like them to, to do and think about uh, I, I think the most crucial thing uh, in the entire supply chain but especially for logistics companies and freight forwarders is to have a, a real strong strategy for the next 10 years in terms of uh, digitalization of your business and thinking about the future. Um, I think there's great opportunities out there, fantastic opportunities for people who, who really uh, pre-plan uh, how they're gonna take their business and see the opportunities out there. There you go. I think, it, I think that would be my key message. Pre-planning, pre-planning. Yeah. Mm -hmm and good the, opportunities uh, uh, in the future. Maureen, um, we had a great conversation with Dan. Uh, I'm going to put you on the spotlight. I know you love that. Uh, what What was your favorite part? What did you learn? Mm, I So I'll be honest, because the, all the, the WA stuff was a very interesting on a professional level, but I read this article earlier this week about I don't know if you had read it, Dan or Enrique, about this uh, pilot who had fallen unconscious um, off the coast of Florida, and the the passenger had called, found the, the walkie-talkie or whatever on the plane, and called um, and was guided in by a flight instructor and landed mm -hmm. the plane, and all everything was fine. And I always 
I'm terrified of flying. Every time we take off and land, I get nervous. So I was thinking of that when you were talking about your story about with your dad and learning how to fly. And I wanted to, I didn't want to interrupt, but I wanted to bring it up to see if you had read the story and kind of I what you say. thought about the feasibility of somebody actually uh, being able to land a plane by almost, you know, paint by number style. Yeah, it sounds that. like a movie almost, right? I mean, that's yeah. what, like I, did, like that. did you read it? It happened no. like in Florida in the past week or so. I'm gonna we'll put it, we'll put the link on, on the call as well. Yeah, and did, the did you episode. read the story or not? Did I did see it. I okay. did see it. And uh, it, it's an amazing story. And it's it's happened a few times in history where, where a live plane, so the pilot's gone over, someone, some novice has taken control. And they were over and the ocean and everything, yeah. It, it must be terrifying, yes. can you imagine? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, credit's got to go for the people who talk them through what to do. I mean, that's got to be a big pressure situation. Can you imagine? Wow. You well, I guess they called doing. the guy, like the pilot instructor yeah. from home or off his lunch break or something. They're yeah. like, we have a situation. We need you to come in. And wow. Well, well that's yeah. it. Yeah. It's uh, it's incredible and a good story. Dan, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for joining us today. No, for course, everyone out pleasure. there listening to another episode of Logistics with Purpose. If you like conversations like the one that we just had with Dan, don't forget to subscribe. Thank you so much. Safe travels, everyone. <laughs> and um, have, a, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much.